Secrets? Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's workshop from CAPS. My name is Joanna Ransdell. I'm a clinical social worker with CAPS here at U of M Dearborn. I am Charlie Starkman. I am a, a clinical psychologist and the outreach coordinator here at CAPS. And today, Joanne and I are going to be presenting on DBT or dialectical behavior therapy skills and how you can implement these skills to, uh, to help you out in various areas of your, um, of your life. So we'll be kind of alternating back and forth and giving you just overall like a general overview of, um, of DBT, what it looks like and how you can implement it in your day-to-day um, -day -day life. For sure. And um, if you don't know what DBT is, um, you know, I would say it's more than just a therapy. It's kind of a way of life and a totally different lens to um, kind of view life with. So I think these skills can be really beneficial for all of us, whether or not you're personally struggling with any sort of mental health condition. So we hope that this will just kind of help give you some ideas how to cope with stress, how to kind of build um, a more satisfying life and how to kind of meet life's challenges more effectively. So yeah. here we go, let's get started. All right, <clears throat> so I'll start by giving, uh, giving a brief overview of DBT. So, it's a specific type of cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, but it's a bit different and we sort of refer to it as like a third wave therapy because where DBT differs from other forms of cognitive behavioral therapy is that it focuses a lot more on acceptance and mindfulness approaches as well as change. So it's kind of like balancing both, which makes it a bit different from other um, other approaches to therapy. And it's fairly recent. It wasn't, um, it wasn't created that long ago. Um, it was created by a psychologist named Marsha Linehan, who actually had her own um, struggles with her, uh, with her mental health and realized that the therapy, even that she had been receiving in her own treatment, wasn't beneficial for the types of problems that she was experiencing. So <clears throat> ultimately, she developed this approach to treatment to better help um, individuals struggling with a variety of different, um, different mental health conditions. So what's the goal of DBT? Ultimately, to identify negative thinking patterns and to also push for positive behavioral changes as well, sort of the large, you know, the large scale overview. But I think also even more than just how to approach thinking, like Joanna said really beautifully, that it's an approach to a different way of life, being more, being more mindful, being more connected, being more aware, and how ultimately this can help us to live a more meaningful life. So what makes DBT really unique is that it was originally designed to treat a disorder called borderline personality disorder. So this is marked by difficulties in relationships, um, emotional instability, so maybe a lot of like intense mood fluctuations, um, issues surrounding like emptiness, sadness, um, interpersonal struggles. But DBT has been expanded to be used as a way to address a lot of different conditions, whether that's eating disorders, trauma, um, substance use, mood issues. So it is a therapy and an approach that can be used across the spectrum. It's not just used for one thing. And it has also been shown to be very effective with, um, with college students. It is being used in counseling centers across the country. It has become, uh, become a standard treatment in a, lot of, um, in a lot of hospital settings. Regardless, it's very adaptable. And this is why we wanted to be able to talk about this wonderful approach with all of you. Um, <clears throat> so DBT is comprised of four main modules, um, the first of which is mindfulness. Um, we also have interpersonal effectiveness, and I'm just going to briefly state them because we'll get into more detail of each in today's, um, today's workshop. 
Um, we've also got distress tolerance and emotion regulation. And Joanna and I will go into more depth into each of the four modules um, as we uh, progress through the workshop. Hey, so kind of a pinnacle um, theoretical framework for DBT um, is centered around like mindfulness. I think mindfulness is kind of usually the first skill taught in DBT um, because it's really necessary to have a foundation of mindfulness in order to um, do the other types of skills, right? Um, and mindfulness can mean a lot of different things. It can mean meditation. It can mean, you know, just being mindful during daily activities. And Charlie's gonna go into a bit more of the definition of mindfulness. But one um, way we use mindfulness is to access what's called our wise mind. There are three states of mind that we talk about in DBT that all of us have and all of us use in different situations. The first is emotional mind, and that's simply when your feelings are dominant and logical mind shuts off, and we've all been there, right? How many times have you been really angry about something and somebody says, oh, just calm down, just be reasonable, just think of the facts and logic, and you're like, no, I can't, I'm just too angry, right? So that's an example of being in emotional mind when the emotion is so strong that you just can't think rationally about a situation, right? We've all been there. On the other side, we have reasonable mind. And this is kind of where you're really logical, um, but you're really not in tune with emotions. Um, and this can be necessary, right? Sometimes we go to work. Um, those of us who work in things like customer service or human services, we might have to shut off our emotions, right? Because if you're dealing with a difficult customer who's getting angry with you, you kind of have to be able to keep your cool, right? And not emotionally react. And that's an example of using your reasonable mind. Um, but then there's also wise mind. And this is an important fusion of both. It's when you're both able to understand and be aware of your emotions and the emotions of others. And you're also tapped in to reality, to logic, to reason. Um, and it's a really powerful frame of mind because it helps us really acknowledge what's going on with our emotions so we know how we're feeling and how to take care of ourselves. But we also are able to not be reactive or be impulsive, right? We've got that reasonable mind coming in as well, right? So a lot of DBT is really, how do I access and, and cultivate my wise mind more? so that I'm not impulsively reacting on my emotions, but I'm also not denying my emotions. Another theory of DBT is around the term dialectics, um, obviously called dialectical behavior therapy. Most people are like, what does that word that dialectical mean? Um, and that really just is talking about two opposing ideas can be true at the same time, right? So an example here, you can be independent and dependent, right? So we can need um, to have our own autonomy, but also connectedness to others. We can be right, and then the person we're talking to can be also right, like it's just different perspectives, right? So it's really against black and white thinking or either or thinking, being more both and, replacing the word but with and when we're talking, right? So kind of black and white thinking oftentimes gives us a sense of certainty or safety or security, but it's oftentimes really not true um, because things in life are rarely black and white, right? So when we can acknowledge the complexity of life, the complexity of people, we have better relationships, right? We're not viewing people as all good or all bad. We're not um, viewing ourselves as all good or all bad, right? We're acknowledging complexity, and that can just kind of help us feel a little bit more stable, right? Uh, black and white thinking can also contribute to a lot of the mood instability that is at the core of a lot of different mental health challenges. So that's a little bit about DBT to start. Right, so I am going to be talking a bit about mindfulness. So we know that mindfulness is the first of these core modules that is typically the entry point of DBT. 
So how do we define mindfulness? And I'm sure that folks watching have probably heard of mindfulness. It has become very uh, common in today's, um, today's jargon. And, you know, we, you know, we all have sort of our own preconceived notions of what mindfulness is. So we'll go through it. Um, as it is the backbone of DBT, it's really important that you understand mindfulness, which can be summed up as paying attention with intention to the present moment without judgment. So we can sum it up as being present, being aware, and being non-judgmental. So taking in what we're experiencing as it comes without describing any sort of um, any sort of judgment or subjective experience to it. Recognizing that in the context of DBT, we have to first be able to, you know, attain or at least work towards mindfulness before we can really get to a place where we can, um, where we can feel comfortable practicing the skills that we learn in the other modules of DBT. And mindfulness really focuses in on what skills and how skills. So again, really focusing on that objective mindset, being able to, to describe what's happening and identifying concrete steps that you can take to get to that place where you've attained, um, you've attained a sense of mindfulness. And I always, like, I always like to just mention that mindfulness is not the same as relaxation. I think sometimes we get, um, we've almost in a sense been taught or conditioned maybe that because we link mindfulness so often to relaxation that they're the same thing, but they're not. A person, you know, when they're practicing mindfulness, mindfulness is not designed to attain relaxation. You are trying to, through an intent, being present in that moment. It's not relaxation. If that's an after effect or if that's an extra benefit, that's great. But that's not the goal. The goal is to be present, to be aware of what's happening in the moment without judgment. It's just a little um, about the differences there. So we've got three different skills that fall under this mindfulness umbrella. So we've got our observe, you know, our observe skills. So when we're, you know, when we're practicing mindfulness, being able to take in what is going on around us, just noticing, sometimes observing and noticing, they can be used interchangeably here. I personally like to use the word notice because mm -hmm you're really taking a very kind of curious stance. You're really looking around at what is, you know, what's, what am I seeing? And what am I hearing? Anything sensory, right? And as we are able to notice and take that in, then we can start to shift more towards a place of describing. So once we've taken in what we can see or hear, then we describe, we describe it. So right now I'm, you know, I'm hearing the, you know, the whirring of my computer going. I can hear, um, you know, I can hear a truck outside my window. You know, being able to you know, notice while also verbally describing or you can write it out, however it is, just being able to identify what you, is actually present in this moment. Once we've been able to notice and describe, then we move into participation where we actively are engaging with what is taking place around us. So, you know, if, you know, mindfulness is something that oftentimes, let's use the example of being outdoors. So, you know, a lot of people engage in mindfulness practice out in nature, right? So actually getting out there and engaging with what is around you can help you to become more present and more aware of what is happening in the moment. Ultimately serves for greater engagement in your, in your daily life, which is the goal here. Yeah, for sure. That's like a really good way of kind of putting those steps of mindfulness. Charlie, do you think um, 
is there like a way that this could be really helpful for people to use in their daily lives or like what's an example of how this framework of observe describe participate could help somebody just in like a day-to-day -day situation I don't yeah know you... so what comes what comes to mind at least for at least for me is to is to even think about it from um, maybe from like the perspective even of something school school related like noticing um, you know noticing what's coming up let's say um, around like a big a big exam or a paper or something that that's due noticing what sensations you're experiencing describing you know describing what that feels like maybe you notice that your you know maybe you notice that your heart is your heart is racing um you know your thoughts are your thoughts are going really fast and it becomes really hard to be you know to be completely present the participation aspect of this framework I would say would be to actually engage to actually mm -hmm. step in as opposed to leaning away from or backing away from so like I said mindfulness is not necessarily about relaxation or feeling comfortable it's about connecting to the present moment without judgment so by being able to contact those feelings being able to notice and describe what's going on it makes it easier for us to actually engage in situations that might be uncomfortable i'm wondering maybe joanna if you have a better example because now i'm thinking about it like i don't know if that was the best one really good example because i was thinking that would be really helpful during an exam right if you're yeah. feeling really anxious you first just notice, okay, my heart's racing, my palms are sweaty. Mm -hmm. um, I'm having a lot of like running thoughts of questioning if I know this material, right? So even just noticing judgment or noticing self-doubt, right? Um, and then describing it to yourself, not necessarily out loud during an exam, but I'm feeling nervous, I'm feeling anxious. I'm, you know, I'm noticing that this is um, triggering some, some feelings of self-doubt, right? Rather than judging yourself and saying like, oh, I'm so, I'm such an idiot. Why can't I just focus, right? That would be an example of a judgment. But when we're able to just to describe mindfully like that, um, it helps us then carry on. I feel like there's a lot of power in just like naming your feelings and then be like, okay, I'm anxious, let's go, let's do this exam, I'm just gonna take some deep breaths. Um, a lot of times when you name your feelings to yourself even, it takes the power from them and it doesn't feel like they're controlling you as much. Um, and that non-judgmental piece I think is so key. So for, for folks who are watching, um, we'd like to go through and do a brief mindfulness activity with you. So what I'd like everyone to do is first find a comfortable position, either if you're sitting in a chair on the floor, and allow your eyes to relax and find a fixed gazing point. So maybe that might be, you know, staring, staring straight ahead at something on the wall or looking down at the floor whatever whatever it might be and start to just tune into your senses thinking about the five senses asking yourself what what do i feel in this moment what do i hear what do i smell what do i taste and what do i see and the challenge is to engage in a non-judgmental way, in a mindful way to each sensation in real time. So practicing observation and noticing, describing and participating 
and engaging with each of these senses. And this is a really helpful activity, not even just to, you know, to ground and bring that connection awareness back to the present moment, but also a really great way to be able to practice describing. I always think that this is a really, really great activity to do in order to start to put words to what you're actually taking in around you. Because when we can label, you know, label what's taking place around us, it helps us to feel more comfortable and engaged with what is actually, with what our actual experience is. So it's very brief. And it's not like other activities where we might be able to, you know, have you write something in the in the chat box, but hopefully it's something that you can take with you and practice. Again, remembering that DBT and all of the Encompass skills are about practice and being able to build these into the fabric of your, um, of your life. So this has been the overview of mindfulness. I'm going to turn it over to Joanna to share all of her wonderful knowledge on interpersonal effectiveness, which I think is coming next. For sure, and I really like that this like brief mindfulness activity. I noticed like when you asked me this question, I never have really noticed or felt like what my arm rests feel like on my chair, and I'm like, oh, that's what they feel like. So it's like weird. It's like sometimes we just don't even take notice of things we interact with every day, but um, just taking that moment to be present is really cool. Um, and it's simple as that, like mindfulness can sometimes feel like, oh, I don't know how to practice mindfulness, but it can be really simple. Just pay attention to what you feel, what you see, what you hear in the present moment. Okay, so interpersonal effectiveness um, is a huge part of DBT because like Charlie said, a lot of people who end up um, coming to a DBT therapist struggle in their relationships, right? Um, and relationships are hard for most of us, right? I think all of us can name a few struggles we've had in relationships with others, whether these be your family members or whether these be um, friends, romantic partners, colleagues, bosses, right? So it's really crucial that we develop skills to be effective or to be um, kind of competent in our relationships with other people, right? So the overall goal of interpersonal effectiveness skills in DBT is to improve our relationships with others and also maintain those relationships that are important to us or helpful to us, right? Um, part of this is assertiveness skills. Um, a lot of us can struggle with assertiveness because we are uncomfortable just directly asking for help or asking for what we want. Um, but those skills are really important for all kinds of relationships, right? Um, on the other hand, assertiveness is also about setting appropriate boundaries and saying no. Some of us believe that if we say no or we set boundaries, we're being mean or we're being kind of pushy. But the fact is we all need boundaries in relationships and being able to communicate those does not have to be aggressive. It doesn't have to be rude. It can be really clear, direct, and kind. Um, also, I think the most compassionate people are actually the most clear about their boundaries because you really know what's okay and what's not okay. And you know where that person is willing and able to help, right? So having boundaries allows you to protect your internal resources so that you're able to bring your best self to other people. It's not selfish. In fact, it's good for your relationship to set boundaries, right? Um, some of us really just need help finding positive and helpful relationships. Maybe you're the kind of person who's watching right now, like, I just don't know if my friendships are that healthy. I don't know if my family relationships or my romantic partnership is very healthy, right? There's maybe dependency or there's um, struggles there. So how do, you, how do you determine what's a healthy relationship, what's a positive relationship, and how do you keep those going once you find them, right? Also, your self-respect, right? 
a lot of us can sometimes be the kind of people where people pleasers, we want to like always, you know, make people happy and we can lose our self-respect in trying to please others. So it's important also to kind of try to maintain your self-respect, um, not sacrifice that for others. So um, there's all sorts of skills that help us with those, um, those kind of tasks, but just for time's sake, because we don't have, we only have like one hour to go over DBT, I'm just gonna kind of share one skill with you called Dear Man. Um, and Dear Man is a skill that's gonna help us with that first category of assertiveness. Dear Man is just an acronym for how to ask for what you want from somebody else. You can also use it to say no. So I'll give an example of each of those. So the first part, the dear, that's what you say. And the man part is how you say it, right? So you've got the what skills and the how skills, just like we were talking about with mindfulness, right? So what you say. First, describe the fact, right? So one example where you might ask for something you want. Maybe you need to ask for a day off because you want to go on vacation and um, you're asking your boss, right? So I would just start by describing the facts. So, hey boss, um, I got invited to a family gathering. It's going to be from August 21st to August 25th. Um, I, and then, so maybe that's enough, right? You just gave the facts. You're not sharing your opinions or really, you're just starting on kind of neutral ground, setting the stage. Then you express your feelings or opinions. Um, so in that case, I might say, I'd really like to go. Uh, I haven't seen my family for a while and I think it'd be really fun. Assert your wishes. So this is where you directly ask for what you want. Sometimes the scariest part, but we need to really know how to directly ask. Um, what what we want from that person. So I'd really like to take off Friday through Tuesday that week so that I can attend this family gathering. And then R is reinforce. So this is kind of um, where we signify for the other person why it might benefit them or um, you know, what's in it for them in giving us what we want, or it's sometimes where we just kind of reinforce by showing appreciation um, for that person. So in this case, it might be, you know, I think going to this trip would really help me refresh my, my mind and come back to the fall semester, like super focused and ready to go. Um, and then that alone is just kind of what you might say in that circumstance. Going down that path, you don't have to do it exactly to the book, but this is like a helpful training wheel for developing assertiveness or asking for what you want. You wanna stay mindful, right? So if that person's being difficult, really stay focused on your goal and don't react, ignore any attacks that come your way. I know it's hard, um, but your goal is for that person to be on your side. So being mindful of that appear confident, right? Even if you're nervous about asking for what you want, you can still kind of fake it. You can kind of present in a confident manner. What are the ways a confident person talks, right? They're usually calm, but they also have a very clear and direct tone of voice. They're making eye contact. They have good posture, right? They're not kind of like sulking down or looking away. Um, they're also not being really aggressive either. So appearing confident, and then of course, be willing to negotiate. So if your boss is like, you know, I really would like to give you that time off, but we have this really important presentation they need you to do on Tuesday. Maybe you say, okay, that's fair. Would you mind if I just take Friday and Monday off and then I'll be back for that presentation on Tuesday so that I can at least attend part of the weekend, right? So being willing to give a little bit to get. You can also use this format to say no right? Like um, if somebody's asking for you to do something for them and you really just don't have the availability or you um, aren't willing to do it, you can describe the situation, express how you feel, really assert your, your position and then reinforce as to why, right? So you can use that 
for saying no as well. Um, anything that you would add to that, Charlie? Oh, I think I think that was a really good I think that was a really good overview of it. I think that sometimes, at least in my experience, is that the how part, the man part, is sometimes the most challenging for people, as well as assertiveness. I would say that the A and then the man are probably some of the hardest, you know, the hardest parts of utilizing dear man because it kind of goes back to what you were saying, right? That we're oftentimes so concerned with how we appear and are fearful of appearing too, um, too conflictual or angry or that we're being mean to other people that we might actually even fall into a place where we become more submissive and it's going to really deter us from being able to get our wants and needs met. So you know, recognizing too that even though it feels really scary, people usually appreciate when we're when we're assertive, when we're clear, when we tell them where we where we stand. Because when we're kind of wishy-washy or not sure or you know come across as very hesitant, sometimes that can be frustrating to people. And it, you know, it leaves a lot of room for miscommunication. And as a result, again, not hitting that ultimate goal of getting your wants and needs met. So that's the only thing that I would, I would add, but those are, I think, really excellent examples. Great. So now I'm going to turn it over to Charlie to talk a little bit about, uh, I think it's emotion regulation skills. Yeah. All right. So emotions, those are fun. We all have them. Sometimes they can feel pretty enjoyable and other times they don't. Um, sometimes we are, sometimes we feel our emotions very strongly. Um, sometimes it's more difficult for people to connect to their, um, connect to their emotions. Um, emotion regulation is an important skill because, you know, we often in the heat of um, certain situations, we might experience emotions that might not necessarily feel great very strongly. We might feel extremely angry. We might feel embarrassed or ashamed. We might feel guilty. Um, feelings that we typically or we typically view as quote unquote negative <clears throat> that when they start to feel very strong or overwhelming, it becomes really hard for us to manage. And in DBT, when we practice emotion regulation skills, these skills are designed to help us manage our feelings effectively, as well as to reduce emotional vulnerability, or basically allowing us to feel, you know, to feel more stable and more measured in terms of what we're feeling, because there's an important you know, something that's important to note here is that, you know, with DBT, the, you know, there's an aspect of emotion regulation that, you know, it's called opposite action, which is you know, thinking about an emotion as something that can be changed. So, you know, if we're in a situation where, you know, we feel, we feel really angry and we want to go and, you know, shove someone or punch someone, like the opposite action to change like that action urge or the emotion that we feel would be to um, would be to maybe hit something, either hit something soft or give someone a hug instead. Like the opposite to help to change that really unpleasant, strong emotion into something that is more tolerable. So you know, we have the capacity to change and regulate our emotions, but like everything else, it's a skill that takes time to practice, especially if we were either raised in an environment or have a lot of relationships in our lives that are marked by a lot of really heightened emotions. So let's say you, know, you were raised in a family where everyone was very, you know, very loud, very aggressive, very um, very forceful and emotions where intentions were always running really high. It might feel foreign to be in a place where you feel kind of 
regulated and not necessarily experiencing emotions very strongly. But it's an important skill to be able to start to develop because if our emotions are too, you know, are too strong or too overwhelming, it makes it really hard for us to be present. So kind of thinking again about how this links back to mindfulness, sort of how everything comes back to, to being mindful as the core of DBT. So I'm going to go through the please, uh, the please skills with you. So this is an approach to emotion regulation by, um, by using pretty straightforward, clear strategies to help, you know, address different areas of our functioning physically, psychologically, um, you know, to allow us to become more emotionally regulated. So the P and the L, treating physical illness, and we could also link this to personal hygiene, making sure that we're in a good state physically and taking care of our bodies. Uh, there's a really strong mind-body link, and we have to be able to treat our bodies well in order to function at our best psychologically. So the E in please is eating a balanced diet. There's a link, again, between mood and food, right? So hangry, I'm sure we've all heard that term, right? It is very real. When we are extremely hungry, we become irritable. Our, you know, our patience is uh, considerably thinner, um, and we find that it becomes very hard to focus and to kind of rein in our emotions. So, recognizing that eating at regular intervals during the day, as well as you know, nourishing ourselves with healthy food, is what's going to help us feel more regulated in terms of our moods and our emotions. Um, the A, avoid mood altering substances. So what this means basically is you know, working to decrease the frequency of alcohol and drug use as we know these can have a pretty powerful impact on, um, on our psychological functioning, our physical functioning and our emotional functioning as well. Um, we might find that when we drink a lot, you know, we, don't experience our emotions in the same way. We might become a lot less inhibited. Um, some people might describe themselves as an angry drunk or a funny drunk, et cetera, et cetera. But we know that these substances have very powerful effects on um, our emotions and our feelings and recognizing that to reach a place where we're in charge of our emotions and they can be regulated in a healthy way we want to avoid the use of substances that might alter our mood. Getting good sleep is really important. Um, we know that if we don't get a good night's sleep, we might wake up feeling cranky the next day. We might still feel exhausted, crabby, again, that irritable, sort of low patience. And to help us feel centered and regulated, we want to make sure that we're getting good sleep, that we're practicing good sleep hygiene, trying to get a consistent amount of hours of sleep a night. Maybe, and for everyone that's different, but we want to aim for between like that seven to nine hour, uh, the nine hour range, and just generally making sure, again, that we're taking care of our body. Exercise, the E. You know, thinking about how we keep ourselves, how we keep ourselves active, exercise produces endorphins, feel-good chemicals. You know, the more that we engage our bodies, the, the better we end up feeling. And exercise can look different for everyone. Um, that might be running a marathon for some people. It might be you know, taking a brisk walk around the block for someone else. Regardless of what it looks like, the goal is to be able to keep your keep your body in action, to be able to notice the ways in which keeping yourself active can help regulate your emotions and also just to help you feel better in general. And then just brief overviews of the ABC and opposite action skills. So I've kind of talked about 
opposite action already, but with the ABC skills, we're looking at how to build up our mastery, gaining a sense of how to cope ahead, so preparation, and more long-term positive experience. So we want to be able to build those things up over time. Right? And how do we build mastery over, um, over something? How do we build mastery of a skill? Practice. And again, this kind of brings in everything that we've talked about so far. And you'll find that with DBT, you can kind of build on top of each other so that once you start to learn the skills across the modules, it all starts to come together. Um, I know I gave a brief example of opposite action, um, but to sum it up, opposite action is an emotion regulation skill where a person will act in an opposite way to an unhelpful action urge. So let's say that you're feeling sad. And a lot of times when we feel sad, our natural urge is to isolate, to maybe stay in bed all day, not want to do much. The opposite action in this situation would be to get out of bed, maybe go for a walk, get some, get some exercise, get some fresh air, or call a friend, be around other people. So it might feel very hard to engage in that opposite action, but it's also the most productive way to be able to change that unhelpful emotion. So this is the brief overview of emotion regulation, and I'm going to turn it over to Joanna to talk about distress tolerance. All right, so our last category, our last module that we'll be talking about is distress tolerance. And um, these are skills that just help us manage um, everyday difficult, stressful situations. Right. Um, no matter who you are, how fortunate your life is, we all encounter discomfort and distress in our lives. And that's a good thing because growth and change and imp improvement usually require discomfort. So when we have a really low tolerance for discomfort and stress and pain, right, we can end up um, engaging in really avoidant behaviors that actually prolong pain and turn it into suffering. When I think of suffering, I think of just prolonged pain, right? So if we can't kind of sit with discomfort, we end up avoiding and then making situations worse, right? Um, maybe you can think of a time that you've done that, like I certainly can, where, you know, you really didn't want to deal with a situation, maybe you didn't want to have a really uncomfortable conversation with a friend, um, but then it just built into more resentment and kind of suffering later on in the relationship. That's one example. So it's really important that we learn how to manage distressing situations in our life. Um, there are two ways I'm going to talk about doing that. We have more, but um, just two kind of examples of how to practice distress tolerance are distraction, so like healthy distraction, which is diff different from avoidance. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. But then also a term called radical acceptance. Um, you might think it's kind of strange to talk about accepting stress or accepting pain, right? Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to accept the bad parts of our lives or the things we don't like? But um, as Charlie said at the beginning of the presentation, DBT is centered around both and thinking, right? And one of those both and situations is acceptance and change are not opposites, they go together, right? So in order to change anything, you first need to accept it. If you're driving down 94 and you have a flat tire and you just refuse to accept you have a flat tire, probably not gonna be a good situation, right? You're probably gonna do a lot more damage to that car, could be in trouble. If you accept that you have a flat tire, 
you're probably not going to have a fun afternoon. You'll be out in the heat, trying to change a tire, calling AAA, whatever you need to do. So is it going to be fun? No. Is it going to be annoying? Absolutely. Um, could be very stressful. But the fact that you've accepted the problem means that you can work on fixing it. It's the same with any sort of problems that come up in our life. We cannot solve it and if we don't accept it. So radical acceptance is the decision to radically, like fully mind, body, and spirit accept whatever your life is right now, today, even if it's not what you want. Acceptance is not approval. Acceptance is not giving up. Acceptance is not saying everything's fine and I'm not going to change it. It's simply saying I'm willing to recognize and acknowledge my reality as it is in this moment. Um, and then after that, you can kind of suss out, like, what are the things that maybe I could work on? What are the things I can't change that I just really need to fully accept, right? And where can I put my energy that's going to most benefit me? So when we talk about distraction, oops, went a little too far. When we talk about distraction, um, what that means is how we can kind of give ourselves a break from short-term distress. So it's a short-term skill that we use to kind of regulate ourselves, bring ourselves down from like high anxiety, high stress level, and then go back to deal with the situation that's stressing us out. So for example, let's take that first example of the, um, maybe you're studying for that exam and it's really stressing you out because you're really nervous about it. And let's say your anxiety gets to like an eight out of 10, right? I'm so stressed about this exam, I can't even focus on the material. Distraction might be a really good thing to use in that example because it will allow you to take a break, calm yourself down a little bit, relax your body and your mind, and then go back to doing your studying and be more effective at it. So what are some ways we can distract ourselves? We can use activities. And when I say activities, really use that word active, right? If your anxiety is an eight out of 10, sitting down and watching a movie or reading a book, probably not an activity that's really gonna be helpful because you really wanna choose something that's gonna actively engage you and your senses. So that means something more physically active. It could mean something just more mentally active, like um, cooking or baking, you know, because that would require a lot more focus um, than simply sitting on the couch and watching a movie, right? So we want to choose something active. Contributing. So doing something kind for others can be a really great way to change our mood and also put our um, attention on something else that makes us happy, like writing a note to somebody or calling a friend you haven't talked to, to in a while or like going and, um, you know, mowing the neighbor's lawn if you kind of have that relationship with your neighbors where that wouldn't be weird, right? Like, so contributing to others can be really great distraction. Comparisons, so, so this could just be like gratitude, right? Like naming what are some things you're grateful for that you have now in your life that you didn't have before? What are some resources that you have that you can use to help you? How have you grown from um, other situations you've been in? What are some other times you've been in a stressful situation and how did you get through it, right? So that's what we mean by comparisons. It's not meant to be invalidating or denying your emotions. It's more just kind of putting things in a different perspective. Creating opposite emotions is pretty much the same as what Charlie talked about with opposite action. So doing something that's, like if you're feeling really anxious, um, an opposite emotion from anxiety is is calm. So it might mean taking a, a nice walk or like smelling some lavender or something like that. Pushing away. So building a barrier between you and a problem, right? So that means I'm going to, I'm not going to be in the same room I'm studying for this test because it's making me so anxious. I'm literally going to walk out of the room, go into a different part of the house, leave the house altogether, go outside, right? I'm really distancing myself from the problem just temporarily so that I can get a break. Thoughts, so using your mind, doing puzzles, Sudoku, you know, um, reading a book, 
that's really interesting that requires your attention. So using the mind can also really help. Um, and then sensations. So using the power of the senses, like um, actually it's the smelling lavender would kind of work for this one as well. Or maybe just kind of taking like a cold shower, maybe you just really need to shock your system and that would just really help distract you. Um, or, you know, go outside and just feel the heat of the sun. So those are just some tools you can use to distract yourself. And remember, short term, but go back to the stressful situation once you're done distracting. All right. So those are kind of all of the skills that a really, really brief overview of DBT skills. Um, if you found some of these interesting or you feel like they'd help you, but you want some more information, we at CAPS, we're happy to meet with you individually or answer any questions. You can give us an email at umdearborn. Or sorry, umdearborncaps at umich.edu. Um, and we'd be happy to kind of talk to you more about these things. Yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we hope that you were able to take some take some new um, take some new skills or just even new ways of kind of thinking about some of the you know, there's some of the struggles that you might be facing and just different ways of being able to approach them with that helpful approach of balancing acceptance and change. All right. All right. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you guys all for tuning in and we will see you for our next workshop. Bye-bye. Okay.